be here. It's great to be here, and uh, thank you for, this is a wonderful thing to see uh, all this excitement around analytics, and I'm very much looking forward to the three days. I want to talk a little bit about the power of predictive analytics, kind of get, kick us off on the right foot to, uh, to say, hey, why is this worth listening to? I've, I found out I'm an executive now. I really think of myself as a scientist, but uh, I get kicked out of the room when people need to brainstorm because I, I squash things, right? I'm the, that, that's how you know you're an executive is when they kick you out uh, because you might influence things too much. But anyway, I also know I'm an executive because I really, really, really am interested in the bottom line. And uh, is this all worth listening to at all? So I thought I'd just give a brief inspirational talk about some of the uh, things that analytics can do. And as was mentioned, if, if you're interested in the technical details, the Thursday workshop will be a lot of fun. If, if, if you think if it's a lot of fun, it's for you. Yeah, that's, that's a good clue. If you think, wow, that would be fun, learning about the details. Um, so I want to talk about uh, data science and predictive analytics and data mining, kind of all synonymous with one another, learning from data. If you have uh, deductive knowledge is where you have a theory and it applies to specific cases. Data mining, predictive analytics, is inductive. You have specific cases, and from that you learn the general principles or the theory that will apply to the future. So it's a fascinating field where you're really building something that will help you have a crystal ball or a palantir, like the hobbits, to look into the future. Uh, and, uh, and, and I find it uh, fascinating. Uh, three ways that it mainly helps is to eliminate the bad, to discover the good, or to streamline and semi-automate something you're already doing. I have a number of examples. I thought I'd highlight just, a, just the, the highlights of each and uh, showing how you can, say, find the needle in a haystack or discover something new that hasn't been known before and so forth. Then I thought I, I couldn't help but share one of our secret weapons about how ensemble of, of models, sort of a board of directors of models rather than a single CEO of models, how an ensemble of competing models can be combined to improve performance, and uh, then what you might look for in a successful project. So uh, quite ambitious for a brief talk, but uh, hopefully it gives you inspiration for uh, some of the details. Now, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Watson at lunch, and uh, a generation before Watson, IBM's major uh, project that they took on to sort of spur their scientists was Deep Blue, a chess playing machine. And here's a cover article from Time Magazine from, I think, March of 96, so quite a while ago. Can machines think? They already do, say scientists, that homogenous band. So what, if anything, is special about the human mind? Now, I'm an engineer, and so I got a chuckle when I noticed that the, most of the scientists they interviewed were computer scientists. I'm not sure that counts, but anyway. Uh, uh, but the silliest thing I've ever seen in print was from an MIT computer science professor who said, of course machines can think. After all, humans are just machines made of meat. And I thought, now that's really a high AI view or maybe a low human view. I said, how can anyone who's worked with computers and worked with humans think that? And then it occurred to me, he's from MIT. He's never worked with humans. <laughs> so it makes more sense now. But anyway, as we know, the human and computer strengths are much more complementary than alike. You can't have a new idea as a computer. You can only pull together what's gone before, but you can do look at lots of variables as a computer all at once and be very precise. So you really need the combination of skills, and finding that perfect combination is important. Now, when a new technology comes out, the Gartner Group gets to put it on their curve. You know, there's a, there's a cycle that everything goes through. They call it the hype cycle, which is a great name. Technology trigger occurs. Everybody gets all excited about it. There's the peak of inflated expectations. The inevitable trough of disillusionment, sort of like the slough of despond there. You know, then the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. Isn't that great? What great names. So what was really exciting about this was to see that the Gartner Group put data mining, if you see on the far right there, way up there on the plateau of productivity. But what's really exciting about this slide, this is May 2003. So it's cutting edge, but it's not bleeding edge. A lot of the craziness has been shaken out of it, and it's been, uh, it's been productive for many, many years. Elder Research turned 20 uh, a month ago. So we've been doing this full time uh, for 20 years, so we have a lot of solved problems in, in the industry as a whole, although it comes in waves with each new uh, idea and technology, is quite mature and very bottom line oriented. I think that's what's driven a lot of its success, is it's not just trying to figure out how the brain works or anything like that's hard to measure like that. 
It's trying to solve actual business problems, and you know very quickly whether it's working or not. I want to give a few examples of some of the successful projects. This is, I'm going to give the technical version and then verbally give you the, the overview. This is a schemata for a system we built for the Internal Revenue Service, the uh, tax authority at the U.S. They were looking at a particular kind of fraud that was getting worse and worse in something called earned income tax credit. It's kind of half welfare. It's a way to encourage folks to take entry-level jobs, still give them some public assistance from, from citizens via the IRS. Uh, but the problem was organized crime especially was finding ways to cheat the system and create imaginary people and get refunds for people that didn't exist. And the fraud was uh, sort of escalating out of control. You know, fraud is kind of like cockroaches with, or termites or something. By the time you see one, uh, you're, you, you, know, you know there's a lot more going on that you don't see. So they had a system that, uh, that would flag needle in a haystack type problems. What's an unusual looking tax return or, or application? The problem was there were a lot of false alarms. You know, when you, when you predict something is going to be compliant and not flagged or non-compliant and flagged, this is what you want, things along the diagonal of the truth table or confusion matrix. And the off diagonal are the false alarms and the false dismissals. And false alarms get to, they're cheaper. You know, if we had a false fire alarm right now, it would be inconvenient. If we had a false dismissal where a real fire was going on, that would be far more serious. So all errors are not created equal, and you need to balance it. But if you have too many false alarms, people will turn the system off. And this thing was firing 100 times, saying something's wrong with this return, for every one that turned out to be fraudulent. And we built a system, long story short, that was 25 times better. In other words, for every 100 times it fired, 25 of the returns were fraudulent. And a couple of years ago, we were told that the system had already been credited with saving taxpayers seven billion dollars. They paid a small fraction of that for the model, but anyway, uh, it was a, a big success. And so talking about how to, how to build things like that, identifying needles in a haystack, things that, uh, the vast cloud of, of possible things, where do you want that precious resource, the time of your analysts, where do you want to focus that? The computer is, and data mining and predictive analytics is extraordinarily good at prioritizing the work for your experts to do the final judgment on. We did some work with Hewlett Packard uh, for years, and in the first nine months, they recovered 11 million. Again, anti-fraud. You say, how can you defraud Hewlett Packard? Well, it turns out there's lots of ways. Uh, news you can use, hopefully not. But anyway, uh, when you return uh, uh, something, they have a subcontractor looking at that, and they don't actually check whether you returned what you said. They just check if you returned something. So fraudsters would uh, buy broken hard drives for pennies, claim their working hard drive was not, and get a replacement and send something off worth a penny and get something back worth $100. So you do that enough times, it causes a real problem. Uh, another problem we found was no, one that no one suspected. There was a, a, a large number of fault not founds, the laptops returned that no one could find anything wrong with. It just takes twice as long as actually fixing a laptop. Well, long story short, it turned out that a couple of large international consulting firms were intentionally claiming falsely that something was wrong with the laptop right before the warranty expired, and thereby getting an upgraded laptop and an apology when none was due. So what Hewlett Packard thought were some of their best customers were actually cheating them, and they were losing money on every sale. Now, uh, that was, again, not something anyone suspected. It came out of the data. You're like a Sherlock Holmes or, or a, a tracker of animals. You're looking, at, you're looking at clues left behind in the data and trying to discover something. So it's a fascinating job and can have a huge uh, impact. So they found out they had some very serious CEO to CEO conversations after that discovery. Now, those examples were mostly numerical. There was another example of a big success we had and for the Social Security Administration. Normally, Social Security in the U.S. is where you handle uh, public retirement. It's sort of a Ponzi scheme. I mean, uh, a generational uh, uh, asset transfer scheme that uh, helps, uh, helps uh, older folks. Um, but it also has a, a uh, provision in there for disabilities. If someone is poor enough and sick enough, then taxpayers will support you. But only about a third of the people who apply actually get approved and it can often take up to two years. As you can imagine, a large and bureaucratic process. There are five layers of appeal. 
It's quite complex. By the way, if you die while your appeal is still, it doesn't stop your appeal. <laughs> it keeps on going, and then your heirs get a little money. But that's not the whole point. The point is to help people out in a point of need when they, when they need it. And so separating those that are deserving or not is done by adjudicators all over the states, and they're not consistent in their, their views. And uh, that's another thing is the computer is very consistent. So uh, it's extremely valuable to look at how human experts are doing it and learn from that for the computer. But then the humans aren't always right where the judgment is involved. And the computer can, uh, you can look where the humans and the computers most disagree and there's opportunity for learning there, either improving training or improving the, uh, the models. Um, for instance, in this case, one of the adjudicators we noticed always, rec always made a final decision that was the opposite of whatever their supervisor recommended, <laughs> no matter the merits of the case. So there, there are things that, that can come out from looking at data that, uh, that can help you in ways you didn't imagine. Often the data insights are as valuable. Um, so half of the appeals are overturned eventually, partly because of this inconsistency by the human adjudicators, and partly because folks are getting in worse health as time goes on, so they eventually do meet the criteria. So how can we take care of the easy cases? There are a number of easy cases. I've looked at files where really five minutes review should have approved it, and 30 days later, it still hasn't been approved. So 90 days later, it still hasn't been approved. So can the computer just look at all the cases, cherry pick, take the really easy ones, get them out of the way, and then have the people who have, need judgment and uh, to concentrate on the others? And the answer was yes. And the key to that was looking at the text information. So numerical data is extremely valuable, but also text data, which is open and a lot harder to work with, but has huge insights in it in terms of what people are looking at, what uh, they're wrong. Here, looking at the text of what people alleged was wrong with them was extremely valuable for assessing the, the eventual success or not of the application. And so we were able to take that and uh, approve 20% of them instantly with uh, high degrees of accuracy, in fact, higher accuracy than the humans uh, doing the job. So that is, uh, I think, being implemented by IBM. We, we helped do the, we did the uh, research and they're doing the implementation. Uh, the last case I want to look at is a drug discovery case. Now this is a custom visualization we did for uh, the result of taking a placebo. You know, a placebo is an incredibly powerful thing. If you, uh, uh, you have to uh, believe it to see it, I think this is one way you talk about placebos. Uh, the, uh, if you took a placebo versus doing nothing, the placebo would be approved by the uh, Federal Drug Administration for everything. For, it's like that old uh, Saturday Night Live cartoon where they had a product that was good as a dessert topping and a floor wax cleanser. You know, the, the placebo is good for everything, especially if you put side effects in the placebo. You know, people on uh, Twitter and email and Facebook and find out who else is probably in the same study that they are. You get either a pill that has a drug in it or a placebo which is exactly the same without the drug. People find that out and if you have a side effect in the placebo, they think they actually have the drug and the placebo effect kicks in even harder. So if your pee turns blue or you get nauseated or whatever, you're all excited and, uh, and it does better. So for a drug, for a compound to beat a placebo is quite a challenge. And in fact, uh, a talk I'll give tomorrow is about how to create that challenge, how to create that uh, truly um, uh, powerful opponent in your data so that when you find something, you know it's real. And I, talk, I call, call that target shuffling. But I will explain this slide in more detail in the workshop. But roughly speaking, all the data there starts in the middle of the cube and what we have there is a three-dimensional density plot. The outer red surface contains three-quarters of the data. So imagine a scatter plot in three dimensions, 500 data points on the left here. I don't show the actual data points, but I show a shrink wrap that contains three-quarters of the data. Then you slice it and look through it. There's an inner shrink wrap that's green that contains half the data. And then the densest quarter of the data is in those blue shapes. So it's showing you where your data is in three dimensions. And it all started in the middle. If first someone got completely well, they'd be up in the far right corner. If they did uh, a very negative result, would be down here by these three measures. So the placebo is hit. And roughly speaking, the data has spread roughly evenly between positive and negative. There's a little more. The positives got much better. There's a small population that got better right here. 
but a large people got a little worse. Now, this was on a mental problem, so it's a little hard to measure good and bad, but by the three measures that were being used, uh, that's how it is. Now, the problem was Pharmacy and Upjohn had recently merged, and they were later bought by Pfizer, but they had, they had invested $300 million in developing this compound, and it was not passing any of the normal tests that the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration, uses. Years down the road, it was going to use them, but they were so used to studying for the test that that's the test that they were using, even though it was an internal decision. They had to decide whether to go or to abandon ship. They had to decide whether to, to write off the $300 million or invest another billion dollars in taking the next step. And they were about to say no, and as a last gasp, they called us in to see if there's anything we could see in the data that they weren't seeing. Long story short, we found a new way to visualize the data and see the effect of the placebo and then showed the effect of the drug on the same type of plot. So you can see that the, the movement of the patients, the 500 patients on the right-hand side, was very much more positive up in the upper right healthy corner than it was for the placebo. And this is a dramatic visualization. This visualization is used for Discover and it's also visualization is extremely powerful for delivering results. Instead of t-tests and so forth, where we're showing something that even we executives can understand. So uh, they made the billion dollar decision based on this graph and went ahead with it. Now drug discovery is a long process. It took 10 years before I found out the rest of the story. And the rest of the story was it was a tremendous success. It was one of the three drugs, three drugs that that company introduced in that decade. So it made a huge difference in discovering something from the data that was not available to be discovered from conventional techniques. Now remember, I don't know anything about drug discovery, roughly speaking. I mean, the wonderful thing about working and consulting in data mining is you get to learn about so many different fields. And you learn some tricks and techniques and vocabulary and problems. And that knowledge is transferable to other completely different organizations. I did a lot in... Uh, medical work, and then that turns out to be, of course, very translatable to maintenance of machinery, complex machinery like satellites or tanks or things like that. Um, anyway, there's some wonderful parallels you can see. But what we are is experts in data analysis, and people writing papers are not typically experts in data analysis. They're experts in their field, but they're trying to follow some rote formula in the analysis part. Team those two expertises together, and you get tremendous results. Well, one other form of data that's very common these days is linked information. How you're connected to other people by addresses, by friendship, by relationship, all sorts of ways of linking together. Um, and I just want to make one small but important point. Uh, there are a lot of discoveries that can only be discovered by looking at links. Let's take a particular type of bank fraud, for instance. It's known as breakout fraud. Uh, the typical way it works is five people will, will put a million dollars together and create a hundred different accounts of fake individuals. And those accounts will open with a bank, they will conduct business, they will transact, but they will only transact amongst each other. They will only be sending each other money and so forth. The, the million dollars is moving all around and the bank is examining one customer at a time and this customer never breaks the rules. It's always doing everything right behaving very well, all of their measures and scores say this is a great customer, they get a great credit rating, they get uh, take out loans, they start paying on the loans, they take out credit cards, they start paying on the credit cards, and then one day, the entire network disappears with all the money that they borrow. They break out like a, like a cancer. Well, the only way to discover it, because every single person until that moment has obeyed all the rules, every single person, the only way to discover it is to notice the interrelationships of the linkage of the network and how it's a completely separate world from the rest. So the forms of information, uh, text, numbers, links, are all very valuable depending on the problem and uh, can help you stay ahead of these uh, fraudsters and criminals and so forth that are trying to do it. Now, of course, it's also extremely useful for predicting uh, normal things, uh, like whether if, if, if on Facebook one of my kids likes purple kids, 
then her friends are seven times more likely, like Purple Kids also, than someone else of the same demographic. If on a phone calling network, if friends and family, uh, uh, one person switches carriers, the other, their friends and family are three times more likely than any other uh, person of that same demographic to also switch carriers. So the linkage information can supplement other kinds of information as well. Very, very valuable. Now out there in the world of uh, data mining, there's all these phenomenal products, some of which are free, some of which are hundreds of thousands of dollars a year uh, to maintain, and it's a somewhat bewildering. Uh, and to add to that, uh, inside the products are lots of different ways of connecting the dots. You know, when you, when you, when you data mining, you can think of it as a big uh, graph, th graph problem where you're trying to predict something as the altitude and your inputs are the latitude and longitude, let's say, for a two-dimensional problem. And one way to connect those dots is to build a piecewise planar uh, decision tree. Another way is to look at nearest neighbor. Who's, what known case is most like this new case? Uh, and try to predict from that. Another way is to connect the dots in a smooth, nonlinear fashion, like a neural network, which is very powerful, or an old school kernel distribution. And then I invented a method I called the Launay triangles. So there are lots of different ways to connect the dots. And some of the questions are, which way is best? And we'll discover. We'll, we'll talk about some of them on Thursday. But I want to show. I, I can't. I can't help but show uh, one pair of slides because it, com it conveys a secret weapon that we use that we're happy to share. I've written a book on it, so it's already out there. Anyway, uh, here is a contest, a bake-off, if you will, between five different methods on six different problems. And the, f the best method for the problem, the one that did best on new data, is the one at the bottom. It has the lowest relative error. These are on relative scales to expand their differences rather than on absolute scale. So logistic regression, this purple one, Juan on the diabetes problem, predicting which Pima Indian in Arizona has diabetes versus which one doesn't. Uh, but it did the worst on the fake investment problem that's been set up in the literature. Three of these problems are real and three are fake, but there's, there's six of the most popular ones. Hundreds of papers have been written using these data points, and so it provides a great level of comparison, even though this is all uh, a new comparison. Um, and you can see that um, uh, neural nets come out ahead, the red one, does poorly on the first problem, but very well on the subsequent problems. Uh, and if you were a proponent of different techniques, it turns out that every technique comes in first or second at least twice. And so uh, every dog has its day. And I used that phrase in Santiago, Chile, when I first got this chart and was presenting there. And it was being simultaneously translated, which is pretty impressive, because high-tech words, fastly spoken in a separate language. But when I said every dog has its day, she's, and you could wear a headset to listen to either one, uh, Spanish or English. And when I said every dog had to stay, she said something completely different. It didn't involve perros or anything. So I asked her later, what, what was it? She said, oh, I put it in a local idiom. I said, tell the pig Christmas is coming. <laughs> well, you know, I, said, I looked puzzled. She said, you know, you're the pig in the barnyard. You think you're something. Christmas is coming. You're going to be dinner. I said, that's kind of the opposite of what I was saying. But yeah, no, it's, it's the same idea. Every, I guess every pig, Christmas is coming here, yeah, so you, you think you're hot, logistic regression, the way that you get to this problem, yeah, so anyway, but the, the good news is that, uh, well, the bad news is there's no single best technique, although neural nets, uh, when properly done, are, are, are powerful, and definitely one of the ones I would include in my toolkit, but there's a better way than trying to figure out what are the characteristics of the problem and what's my best algorithm. And that better way is to simply combine those competing methods together. Now, I've made this more complex than I need to. There's four different ways of combining. But take, take for instance, the orange one. That's just averaging together. So you build these five separate models, which it doesn't, it's really not five times as much work, because all the work is getting the data ready. It's only a little bit more work. But you can let your boss think it's five times as much work. That's good. Um, and anyway, then you put the answers together by averaging them, by voting, by doing other more fancy things, um, and look at the results. The, the, the combined, the committee, is now as good as the best individual model, even though you didn't really know ahead of time which one was going to be the best, and there's a lot less variation in the results. So it's a wonderful, it's, it's not guaranteed, but it's a, it's a wonderful way to get extra performance, and uh, it makes a lot of sense if you kind of think of it as a board of directors of some models that all have specialized ways of looking at the world, 
put them together. They have to compromise, and the risk is reduced. Well, I want to conclude with a couple of slides. One is on the lessons learned. What do you look for? How do you know ahead of time? After doing this for 30 years now, 20 years full time, how do you know ahead of time what is going to work? Well, you have to look at the cost and benefit of doing the modeling. How much is the gain and the leverage? You know, for we did some work for Capital One, which is a major credit card issuer in the U.S., and if you could reduce the rates of, uh, and we were very helpful to them, if you can reduce the default rates from, let's say, 10%, making up a number, to 9.9%, you've just made tens of millions of dollars. So that little bit of accuracy on very leverageable problems like insurance, investment, credit scoring, things like that can make a big difference. Um, on other cases, you have low-hanging fruit. You're the first one to ever look at the text comments that people have sent back in that have been subscribed, and now you're recognizing there's a problem with one of your products that you never would have found otherwise. So if you're looking at new sources of data or combining data together that haven't been combined before, there's a tremendous advantage. You do need a team of folks that know the business, that know about statistics and algorithms and so forth, and they have to work together. They have to respect one another. And your information's in your data. Your data doesn't have to be perfect. In fact, if make data clean or step one, there'd never be a step two. <laughs> you know, the data is, but statistics works with noisy data. So it just, the data needs to be uh, understood and the, and the goals need to be right and so forth. But if you can, uh, the better your, uh, your data is at describing the world, the better your models are gonna be. And then time, it takes uh, multiple cycles. Get started early, do some initial project with only a few months that makes a small insight and has a measurable difference, and you'll gain, you'll gain allies. <laughs> Success has many fathers. You'll gain allies. Uh, and lastly, you need a business champion, someone who is, thinks they are putting their career on the line to use analytics. And uh, they're not because the risk is very low, but uh, if that happens, analytics can add extraordinary value. And hopefully, if, if you haven't uh, already seen this movie, the movie Moneyball, Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill. Uh, it's a terrific movie, and for number one, about baseball, and, uh, and, and, but it's really a terrific movie about analytics. So Brad uh, plays a character who was a uh, tremendous recruit, but actually didn't do well in the major leagues. But now he's a manager, and he's got uh, a low budget to work with, so all of his best players get stolen. So he has to find a new way to do it. And he, he notices this analyst here is looking at metrics that other people aren't looking at before. So he, he, gets, he gets us, the data mining nerds, okay, and uh, the business champion starts making decisions based on the data mining. And it's a fascinating story. It's a true story. Uh, initially, it doesn't quite work out, and then it works out tremendously well. Spoiler alert. Uh, but anyway, I... I uh, I took our entire company to see the movie. What I'd really like to do is take all our clients to see the movie because they're the hero of the movie, and it, uh, it does a great job. He literally is putting his job on the line to start making decisions this new way, and he has to persevere. So um, that's all the upside. There's a downside. <laughs> I'll be addressing that tomorrow in my talk uh, where people read too much into data, data things that aren't there. But um, if you do it right, uh, it, it'll be a tremendous success. So thank you for having me. Thank you, John.